Uh, so we're beginning our series, uh, or continuing our series, Deleting Destiny. Uh, we're going with the theme called Disillusion today. So two anchor verses here. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8, we'll read this. Uh, and then another verse, and then my good friend Kirsten Martinez will be sharing this morning at the end of my message. So get ready for that. So First Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says this. Discipline yourselves, keep alert like a roaring lion. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless in love, he destined us for the adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to his good pleasure and his will. Let's pray. Father, we again thank you for your word that does not return void. It's living and active. Holy Spirit, do your work today as we talk about things that are, are difficult at times to discuss. Would you speak on my behalf this morning? God, you're already speaking to people here. We just addressed the sleeplessness. I had a sleepless night last night where the enemy was trying to get a hold of my mind. He was trying to distract me. Father, we pray for those right now that are in this room that are, are restless in spirit. Declare peace in the name of Jesus. Just with your eyes closed. You've been in that place. You see, you know what? I've had many sleepless nights recently and I can't find peace. Lift your hand up if that's you. Father, we declare peace in Jesus' name. The enemy will not have a heyday. He does not have authority or power in the hearts of your people. God, we ask for freedom. And those that have been discouraged and overwhelmed, they've been distraught on the verge of giving up. We say, don't give up in Jesus' name. Holy Spirit, would you come and bring hope and courage this morning? Those watching online that feel alone and isolated, Jesus, we thank you that you're the comforter, that you're the one that surrounds us. Lord, I pray that you just put people's names on our hearts to call and to text, to message right now. Let them know they're not alone, but you see them. You hear their prayer. You're listening to their heart cry. God, we thank you that you're the God of comfort. God, do your work, have your will today. Heal hearts and bodies. Received a text message from my friend this morning who had a couple words of knowledge. He said this, there's a ton of unrest and anxiety. Some can't remember the last time you felt peace and you need a fresh outpouring of a touch from the Lord. Just eyes closed, that's you. So you know what? I need a fresh outpouring of a touch of God's spirit. Just lift your hand up. Father, we pray. For those that don't know peace, that haven't found it in a while, that you are the comforter, you're the healer, you're the restorer of all things that are broken. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your goodness. In Jesus' name. Everybody said, amen. Turn the person next to you and say, come on, God's got this. He's got this. So right after World War II, as Americans settled back into the workforce, a new technology became the centerpiece of the American household. Colored television was now available for everyone to buy. Now, television was not a new technology. It was quite old, but now it was readily available as many of the factories could now produce televisions at a mass scale, and thus was birthed the early 1950s classic television shows. Anybody out there with me? The classic TV shows like I love Lucy. I mean, I love Lucy people. The Honeymooners. Remember the Honeymooners, right? And the greatest whistle solo of all time, The Andy Griffith Show. That was, for me, the favorite. Nick at Night, Dick Van Dyke, all that great stuff. Classic television. However, there's one show that really has stood the test of time, and it seems like every generation has a resurgence of watching this particular show, and that is The Twilight Zone. The Twilight Zone is one of those. Now, for those listening, I did not say Twilight. Twilight's very different than the Twilight Zone. Twilight Zone is very specific. But we can all remember an episode that may have made an impact on us if we saw it. Now, if you talk to people that are true fans of the show, they'll have their list, their top 10 things that were most important for them, like to serve man or where is everybody. Uh, my personal favorite is uh, Finally Time Enough, which featured Mick from Rocky as the librarian. I don't know if you ever saw that one. Uh, but there's so many classic episodes, but perhaps the most disturbing of its time was an episode called The Eye of the Beholder. And in this particular episode, it opens up with a woman named Janet Taylor in her bedside and her face is heavily bandaged. And you hear this conversation between Janet and her nurse and she begins to speak of some type of facial deformity that she has. And you hear this confession from Janet. 
She says, ever since I can remember, ever since I was a little girl, people have turned away from me. The very first thing I can remember is a little child screaming when she looked at me. Haunting words. You then have the doctor come in and ask, you know, how the process is going. And Janet says, when can I remove the bandages? And the doctor says, not yet. We don't know if the surgery was a success. And then the doctor gets into a discussion with the nurse and says, I don't understand why we have to judge people by outer beauty. Why do we have to judge so many by outer beauty when such a sweet soul like Janet? And she says, don't speak that way. You know it's treason. Ugliness is outlawed. This is the phrase. Well, as she continues to plead that the bandages be removed, eventually they're removed and the doctor says the surgery was unsuccessful. Janet screams and you then see her face and this is the face that is revealed, that of a beautiful woman. And you're caught off guard by this. You think, how is this an unsuccessful surgery? That's an amazing plastic surgeon if it turns out like that. And then as she screams distraught, she's then held back by the nurses and it reveals the face of the nurses. And we see that their faces are twisted and distorted. They have noses of a swine. And as she runs out of the hospital room screaming, you then see these projection screens throughout the hall, which is of a dictator with the same face demanding conformity on how ugliness is outlawed. You then don't know what to think of this. She's then led into another room. She's finally consoled. As Janet's there, she's met by a seemingly attractive man in which she's going to go to the village of the exiles where they outcast all the ugly. And this is how it ends. And it says, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Disturbing show, disturbing image that really was haunting and caused you to ask, what is true beauty and what is culture's conformity actually producing? And this was in the 50s. And now we see how the lies have gotten louder. Now, there's a lot we can extract from this image, but there was one statement that really caught me by surprise and really was the undercurrent theme of this episode. And it was a confession that Janet made to the nurse. She said this, page two. She said this, I want to belong. I just want to be like everybody else. She wanted to have this image, this conformity, this certain standard of beauty it was a massive deviation of how God had made her. Very unique juxtaposition in this episode. See, we are wired for human connection. We are wired for belonging. We're called to be a part of a community. You're called to be a part of a tribe and we will do anything in our society to fit in and finally find connection in a significant way. Unfortunately, our society is so broken, brokenness is belonging in many ways. We often have connection and belonging over brokenness and over dysfunction. This is what takes place. And those standards continue to move where you begin to conform to an image and likeness that God never intended you to be. That's what takes place. We learn very early on when in the school system, which is the ultimate factory for conformity and unhealthy standards and hierarchies of what status looks like. But you know this, right? When you enter high school, you know who the popular people are and who they aren't. And there is this hierarchy of importance that's developed. And all you have to do is look a certain way and speak a certain way and do certain things to fit in. Well, after many times and tries and attempts, many are left there. We know it's only a few elite in your high school that can actually be part of the popular crew. You then leave discouraged and think, maybe it'll be different in college. Maybe in college, I'll find connection. Maybe in college, I'll finally fit in. Only to realize that college is adult high school. Same click, same tribe, same immaturity. And then you think, okay, when I'm done with college and enter the real world, when I enter the workforce, then I'll find success. Then I'll find connection only to realize it's adult junior high. That's just how it works. We never find the true connection and fulfillment that we're longing for. And what you begin to hear at the change of everyone's decade, we notice this, when a 19-year-old is turning 20, 
the same existential crisis questions happen as someone 29 turning 30, 39 turning 40, 49 turning 50. Why am I here? What am I actually doing with my life? You'll have a few outliers that are really proud of themselves. It's called narcissism. It's okay. But you'll have many that are wondering, why exactly am I here? What am I called to do? And you hear these phrases, popular buzzwords, and this is not to discount the true chemical imbalances that these are. I understand this. But you'll see depression, sadness, discouragement, anxiety. These are the common buzzwords we use. I'm just really depressed. I'm sad. I think the better term to really describe what many go through at the turn of a decade or a season like last year, as many experienced in 2020, is many are disillusioned. It's actually the appropriate phrase to describe the feelings of many. Disillusionment means this. It's the condition of being dissatisfied or defeated in expectation or hope. Now, we villainize this phrase. I understand what it means. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. I understand that context. But the original word of disillusion is actually not a bad thing. It literally means to be freed from an illusion or an enchantment. To be disillusioned is to be freed from an illusion or an enchantment. See, when we hit these walls, when we hit these difficult moments in our life, it's actually an opportunity to find the true freedom and why you're actually here. Jesus said in John chapter four, the field is ripe for harvest, look around. When you begin to hear people confess and share a season of disillusionment they're in, the spirit is speaking to him. They're speaking to them. And guess who is that person that's called to bring the spirit in that conversation? It's you, not a Sunday service. It's in those moments that we have to recognize the field is ripe for harvest. When people begin to share about their discontentment, the Spirit is speaking and He wants to use you to partner with what the Spirit is speaking. That's a ripe harvest moment. But many of us hear someone's confession. We hear the disillusionment. We say, man, let's just hope it gets better next year. And we actually partner with the disillusionment. We join, we, we, we come alongside disillusionment in that way. That's not helpful. We're called to come and speak confidence and courage. Lift up their spirit. To encourage means to infuse with courage. That's what those moments are. We're called to come alongside of them. What happens is we have this ripe harvest moment. We ignore it, but there's another sower that's also looking to deceive, and his name's the devil. He knows exactly what a ripe harvest moment looks like. He comes in there, he begins to sow other seed, begins to speak lies and whispers, and people fall right back into the same sin patterns they had before. Just like Proverbs warns, warns Proverbs 26, 11, as a dog eats its own vomit, so fools recycle foolishness. We go right back into those things. And we as Christians think, man, I know, the enemy really uses substance abuse. Man, he really uses these vices. And we, we take this elite posture, we hear about people that are struggling and think, well, that's not us. And we think that the enemy has only one weapon of deception. We think he only uses one thing in the same category. He uses porn and drugs and alcohol. He's cunning. He's wise, the Bible says. It's not the wisdom that the spirit has, but he is cunning. He's divisive. See, what he does, it's not the only weapon. Substances is not the only weapon he uses to delete destiny. What he actually uses is substitutes for significance. That's, that's his true strategy. See, I'll say it again. Here we go. Thank you, Lene. What he actually uses is substitutes for significance. You were wired to have a significant connection with the creator you were made in the image of. That's how we're wired, Genesis 1, And we will make mankind, humanity, in our image and likeness. Guess what? That covenant was broken. They felt shame. The spirit left. And now we're left with that vacancy that only the spirit can fill. And so what happens is we know we are wired for more. The same questions happen. What I love is watching the arc of Jordan Peterson just totally take over a lot of masculine men that needed to know, remind who they are. He began to speak about meaning and suffering. Because guess what? That's what it is. Guess what also talks about meaning and suffering? The Bible. Significantly. 
And we have to refine what that purposeful connection is with the creator and the image we're made of. That's really what it is. So as we have this significance vacuum, the enemy brings substitutes in its place. And here is his main playbook. I'm gonna let you in. These are the three chief plays he uses for substitutes for significance. Success, sexuality, and status. This is it. Say, so, well, isn't success and status the same thing? Actually, they're not. Success is about acquiring material wealth or material possessions. Status is about acquiring power and influence. Different. Now, there can be a combination that he uses in someone's life. But these are the three chief things he uses. This is his playbook. And see, these in and of themselves are not bad things. They're not evil. But see, what happens is he uses these tools of Jesus, of the Father, and distorts them. And what was intended to glorify God, just in the end, glorifies humanity and our depravity. They become the idol. They become the thing we worship rather than a vehicle in which we worship God. That's what happens. Joseph was successful. It's a biblical concept, but he was successful because of the provision of the spirit of God in his life, even in prison. There's different things we could talk about here. We don't have time for today. So the tragedy of these three things being misappropriated, becoming idols in our culture, is that when you ask a child today what they want to be when they grow up, it's no longer a teacher, a doctor, a nurse, firefighter. You know what they want to be? They want to be famous. It's the number one thing a child wants to be today. My kids said, Dad, when I grow up, what do you want to be? He said, I want to be a YouTuber. <laughs> Son, that is not your aim in life. But the word that's thrown around is you're called to be an influencer. Influence, status. And we utilize all these things to manipulate emotions and expressions in people and distort God's original design for each and every one of us. The Twilight Zone episode is happening in real time, my friends. We're here. There's a demand and a standard for a certain type of conformity, a certain type of image that is taking place. But here's the problem. Those people that are the influencers, go ahead and put it back up. They're as depressed and dissatisfied as all of us are. Because they too are looking for the answer. They're still trying to find their significance. Get, listen to a real interview of somebody that reached the arc of fame and no longer has it. Watch a boy band documentary. You guys all remember it. I want it that way. Tell me why. There it is. We all remember that era of these icons that had it all. And you watch the crumbling of their lives. Pop stars, Instagram, they're, they're, they're so sad, so grieving. Those that were the, you know, the, the sex symbols of my age, watching them now, it's, it's just so grieving to see the effect that it's had on their life. They're still searching for significance. We've fallen into what Haggai warned as I was praying through this. This is what the Lord reminded me of. This, this really is what set the, the stage for this message today. Haggai chapter 1. Verse six, you've sown much and harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You clothe yourselves, but no one is warm. You that earn wages, earn wages to put them into a bag with holes. It's the condition of our culture. So where we are, we can acquire much. I mean, one of the most depressed places in all of our city is not Thiles Manor, it's Granite Bay. Serious, let's just speak straight. You want to get depressed, go to El Dorado Hills. People that have everything, yet are still longing for something that that's not satisfying. This is our call as a church is to find what this is. Now, Yahweh gave them a solution. The solution is odd, but we'll connect it here in a minute. His solution to them to satisfy that need for enough was this in verse seven. Thus says the Lord, consider how you have fared. I love that phrase. He says, go up to the hills, 
Bring wood and build the house so that it may take pleasure in it and be honored. What does this mean? They had neglected the stewardship of the temple. And after many wars, after much economic difficulty, they now had this beaten, battered temple that was meant to be housed in the presence of God. Now, we no longer have to have the stewardship of a physical, temporal temple location. It's not our reality. It's not a territory where God's spirit is confined to. We are now temples of the Holy Spirit. Collectively, us, temples of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, which you have from God, and underline this, and you are not your own. We think we have way more power over our lives than we actually do. You are a steward of this temple. That's your chief stewardship. And just like Yahweh commanded the people of Israel to go gather wood and build the temple, we have to work on the temple within because you're called to be a habitation of the Holy Spirit. That is our responsibility. That is our chief stewardship. This whole wiring for significance can only be satisfied by the spirit of the living God. That's the only way. And we have to steward it. Now you say, well, why do I still feel this discontentment and disillusionment with God's spirit? Because you don't know what you have in you. You don't recognize what you're actually standing within. My favorite stories was back in late 2000s. It was this minor league baseball player. And he just got his minor league baseball contract. He was called baseball's first billionaire. He gets his minor league baseball contract and gets word from his mother that his grandmother's house is being foreclosed on. Is there any way he can help them? You ever know that? You, you, someone gets money and everybody starts calling. Everybody's your best friend. He has a really meager minor league contract goes and buys the property from his grandmother, is now cultivating the land. They hit this bedrock. He brings out an excavation consultant, finds out he's sitting on a billion dollars worth of quartz, all underneath. And now he has this massive amount of opportunity to excavate and cultivate underneath because what he purchased on the surface was far greater underneath. What you have in the Spirit of God, you've only scratched the surface of. Only a little bit. Very tiny. One of my mentors said, you are sitting on a mountain of victory from the cross, and our life is discovering what we have. You have it within, through the Spirit. This is the broken message. Now, again, in our culture, we say body is temple. That's a distortion of God's original intent. One of the creeds of our culture is body is temple. However, without the resurrection power of God's spirit, we are simply in modern terms, as Jesus warned the Pharisees, grooming glorified graves. Without the resurrection spirit of God, you're just whitewashing tombs. See, you have to have the resurrected spirit in this decaying frame that we have. So what's the answer? It's the Spirit of God, but significance is when the Spirit's in you is understood and understanding these three things you now have access to. These are the substitutes of God's Spirit. You have a spiritual inheritance, you are sanctified, and you have sonship. This is what you have. Now, I know all those gender specificity specificity people are like, wait, sonship. We'll talk about that in a second. Don't get me started with that one. (laughs) You now have a spiritual inheritance. You don't have to seek success as the world's standards are. You now have access to unlimited heaven economy. That's what you have access to. I guarantee Jesus is a better stock stock than GameStop. I promise you. (laughs) I promise you that. The spirit of God inside of you now gives you a spiritual inheritance. Ephesians chapter one, verse three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing. Say every blessing. Say every blessing. He's given it to you. Now, this is the same phrase that Matthew uses in the Beatitudes. It's that word makarios, which means a lot more than hashtag blessed. We've talked about this before. 
It's not the empty promises of what you find on Instagram or Twitter. We're talking about, and again, some people translate it as happiness. That's also a broken expression. What he's saying is you have divine blessing, which is better translated privilege. You now have divine privilege in Christ that is no longer conditional on your economic status, no matter what your background is, no matter what race you are. In Christ, you now have privilege. Very, very different than the message of our culture. Very different. You now have a spiritual inheritance that can meet all of your practical needs. Needs, not wants and desires. Let's push that back. See, we, we, we long for things in the heavenly eternity that are not meant for now. So there, there is a place with gold and diamonds and brilliance, but it's not now. We have a broken, feeble world that we're called to restore through the spirit of God. But he will provide for you, Philippians chapter four. And my God will supply what every need to yours according to the riches in Christ Jesus. He knows your practical needs. He says, as the birds of the air fly around and know what they have, he'll provide for you. So we're talking about. He'll provide what is needed. But you also have far more than that as a spiritual inheritance. We get stuck on the temporal material stuff. You now have the dunamis power of the Holy Spirit living in you. That's what we have. Where you can heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out demons. Go put a billionaire down, down somewhere where someone's having a demonic episode. See how their money works. Doesn't work that way. I have the Spirit of God. You are the most equipped people in most rooms you stand in. Because of God's Spirit. We stress out so much about what we're supposed to say. Didn't Jesus say, you will stand before kings and leaders, and I'll give you the words. Our responsibility, open your mouth. That's our responsibility. He's given you a spiritual inheritance. Number two. He sanctified you. Sexuality has been so perverted and distorted. It's a beautiful thing that God has given all of us that's meant to be in the context of covenant. That's what sexuality is. That's what it's for. And one of my mentors, Jim Anderson, says it so well. He says, we love a good fire when it's in the fireplace, but you take it outside the fireplace, it burns down the whole house. And now we're seeing that in our culture because it's called to be a measure in which we worship God with in the context of covenant that has now grossly been distorted and getting more and more perverse as the day goes on. It's unprecedented what your kids have access to on their iPhones. Like just, if anything you hear today, protect your kids from what's on their iPhone. There we go, rant over with that one. You're sanctified, Romans six nineteen. I'm speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. I love the way Paul says that. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more destruction, and so now present your bodies as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. You are sanctified. It means you're washed, you're made pure, you're holy, you're restored. You are sacred now through the spirit of God. It's a whole lecture in itself. Study sanctification. You are now made holy and blameless. See, what happens is we have this perversion of sexuality because we're trying to find significance when we're longing for sanctification. And so we try to find this and we try to do it more and it only gets worse and worse and worse because you're designed to have sexuality in the context of covenant. Number three, you find significance when you understand your sonship. Romans eight thirteen. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die underline, highlight, write that in your Bible, whatever you need to remember that. If you live according to fleshly desires, you're going to die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you'll live. Some of you need to put some things to death today. You need to kill some things in your life. And you say, you know what? I'm going to sacrifice this on the altar, under the Lord, as an offering, but I don't want it anymore. Invite someone in that process, those things that you've been entertaining, those vain imaginations that you're feeding in your mind. It's, it's, it's toxifying your thought life. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. But you've received the spirit of adoption as sons by whom we cry, Abba, Father. Now you say, isn't that sexist? It's biblical. This has nothing to do with gender. 
It has everything to do with status. It's exactly what it's talking about. A lot of us get really hierarchical in the Bible when we talk about how male dominant it is. Everybody's all hackles are up. I can feel it on both sides. Razor wire I'm walking on right now. Here's the deal. Here's the deal. We've made such a big thing about women in ministry and all these different debates. You, you take your theological premise, you study your stuff out. Here's the deal. Sonship had to do with access to the father and access to inheritance and all that came along with it. That's why they fought for the firstborn. That's why there's such a fight between Jacob and Esau over the firstborn status. Jesus is now, Jehovah's Witnesses take it way out of context, the firstborn of the dead. Does that mean he's the firstborn created one? Colossians 1 is not speaking of that. God came in human form and is now the firstborn son. He's the preeminent one that we now have access to all the sonship inheritance because he shared it with us. He's giving you now access to everything in the Father. That's what we have. And no matter boy or girl, you now have sonship in Christ. That's what this is. And we were, why do you think gender is such a massive issue today? And why is gender fluidity so massive? Because they don't know who they are. They're longing, they're trying to find significance. They're trying to find their place. They don't feel comfortable in their own skin because God's spirit isn't, isn't in there yet. We need to introduce them to the true love and we get lost in these things. We get lost in gender debate. We know how we're wired. We know how God has made you. He gave lady parts and boy parts. We understand those things. But speak to the spirit because there's a war over that soul. The logical thinking is not working. The spirit has to intervene. That's the moment. You speak about significance that the spirit brings. You'll see breakthrough. That's it. Church, it's time to stop villainizing all these things. And you're going to go off and I'm going to get emails, I know. What does that mean? We're not going to stop. We're talking about access in Jesus. That's what we're talking about. When you understand the significance of the Spirit inside of you, you'll begin to walk in the authority as sons and daughters of God. See, we, we've changed our modern translations so much because we're so afraid of offending people so afraid and it's not and again i understand the plurality of the greek words i get it but this has nothing to do with gender specificity and right now if you're all anxious about women in ministry listen you know the person that blew up the women in the ministry conversation jesus did jesus changed all of that stuff he really did well what about paul and timothy i understand there's structural elements of governance i get those things the reason why Martha was mad at Mary wasn't because she wasn't making enough matzah. It's not what that was about. The reason why Martha was angry with Mary, look this up in a theological context, is because she took the position of a man sitting at the feet of a rabbi to learn, and those that would learn would teach. That's why they were angry. Jesus allowed one that was not worthy to sit at his feet and learn. That was the issue. In T. Wright article, look it up. There we go, enough said. You are called to walk in significance that the Spirit has given you. And that searching for significance will not be met by success or your sexuality or your status. Those are not evil in and of themselves, but misappropriated. They will glorify humanity, not the Holy One. But we can stand in confidence in the Spirit of God that has come to bring you a spiritual inheritance. It's come to sanctify you and purify your conscience, purify your spirit, and you now have access as if you were a son.